On today's episode of Finside the NFL, we will discuss Tua and what he said regarding contract negotiations. Plus, are the Miami Dolphins using their top 30 visits to mask their interest in first round and second round? round prospects also the Dolphins hired a new assistant brought in a safety for a visit man we got a ton to talk about on this episode so do me the favor smash the like button subscribe if you're new and as always let's get into this is good for nation what's good it's your boy reason and we are back here for another one the eclipse happened and the world didn't end we're safe people just double checking with all y'all so um shout out to each and every one of you already showing up here on this tuesday and tomorrow i will be live with richmond and ball game will make his triumphant return and then on thursday i'll be live with neil driscoll as well Also, announcement this weekend, I will have Ryan Roberts on the show, one of the best draft analysts on social media. He will be on here. We will discuss the Dolphins. We do it every year because, you know, quite frankly, he's the best. You know, he's better than people you see on ESPN. He's the man. So we're going to have him on Saturday. Um, And, yeah, I'll keep you all posted on Omar Kelly. I got another draft guy coming on, too. So, It's picking up around here. And also the next big board we'll be dropping for all y'all will be safety. So shout out to each and every one of you. Hope y'all enjoy the content that's coming your way. Now, I got to get this off my chest because I know I warned y'all it would happen yesterday, but it didn't happen last night and I thought we were safe. And then I got the email this morning. XOS Digital Sports. They are the bane of the existence for NFL draft content creators. Told y'all it would happen, and sure enough, it did. Didn't happen last night. Happened this morning. I was demonetized for my episode yesterday, and it was uh, the Alab. It was it was some of the J.C. Latham footage. I want to say it was Old Miss. It was the, they labeled it as Alabama Old Miss. You know, listen, I'm going to tell you a story because I don't know if I've told you the story. I, when they de- demonetized me a couple years ago for one of my videos, I, I appealed it. And they basically told me, hey, you better take that down or we're going to go through the process and make sure you get a copyright strike. I got sent from customer service all the way up to like the president of the company. And, and I'll tell you what I told him. How are you going to sit there and take the ad revenue from channels that are promoting these players that are promoting your footage? I mean, y'all aren't the NFL. The NFL lets us use all 22. The only time you really get hit or demonetized for all 22 is if Baldy does a breakdown of the same exact footage, one of Baldy's breakdowns and uploads it. If that happens, they're going to, they're going to demonet They're good. They're going to hit you with a demonetization. Other than that, you're pretty much good. But I'm sitting here and, you know, like if you think about it, I'm also also altering the footage by even just putting those circles or those arrows on it, right? And I'm altering it because I'm clipping it up. Like there's a lot of nonsense pre-snap. You guys don't see motions. You don't see the quarterback taking forever to snap the ball. You don't, you know, unless I want to show it, I don't, 
you know, in these college clips, I don't show rotations because there's just not enough time. You know, I, I usually give about a minute and a half to two minutes for each prospect, and that's pure footage. So every clip counts, right? Every second counts. So, you know, I alter the footage too, but, you know, that's three out of my four big boards that have been demonetized. And I want you to think about this in the, situ like in the spectrum of things too. My show yesterday was an hour and 10 minutes, okay? The footage, the All-22, there was about nine minutes worth of All-22, all right? The one clip that they're demonetizing me for, not even 30 seconds. You are taking the ad revenue from a full hour and 10-minute show for a 10-second clip. Like, it, it's the most ridiculous thing in the world. Like, you know how much work goes into making one of those? Do you know how much work goes into making one of those big boards? I don't even got to count my graphic guy. Just the video process. Just the video process, all right? To clip out one player takes about a half hour, 45 minutes. That's just clipping out the plays. That's not cleaning up the plays. That's just clipping out the plays. And I do five. Each big board. I mean, do the math. You know, let's go on the low end. That's two and a half hours of just clipping. Not cleaning. Not putting the video together. None of that. The video process alone takes about four hours. Just putting together the video. I'm not including how I've already spent time watching these players throughout the year. How I've already written. You know, I write my notes. Then I do a, a little bit of a refresh, rescout. And expand on my notes. And I'm not including any of that time. Because if we're including that time. Then you know. We're talking about you know. Each video would probably be. Man. You know. We're talking like. 20 hours type of stuff here. Right. So. It's just ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. Shout out to Knight. He gifts one membership. Justin. He gained that membership. So. My watermark is already up there too. It's ridiculous. It's unbelievable. So, man, you know, but you know why I do it? Because y'all deserve the best draft content in the world. So I'll take it on the chin. You know what I mean? Really, the only money you get to keep from those videos are any donations. So I'll take it on the chin just because I want to have the best draft content. Y'all deserve the best draft content. Y'all deserve no less. I'm not going to take out all 22 just because it, you know, what, I'm at a 75% clip right now this season. 75% of my draft board videos have been demonetized. I'm not going to take it out. I'm not going to lower the quality and the standard just for the almighty dollar. It's not happening. So, unbelievable though. Unbelievable, you know? It's bad enough you got media out here not giving Bobby Shouse his props. Shout out to you, Bobby. Now you got XOS Digital Sports trying to take money out of your boy's pocket. Unbelievable. So and you know what you know what you know what kind of taps my ass a little bit about it. This is what kind of pisses me off. Okay, okay. Let's say I use a clip from FS1 and I get demonetized because it happens to before. You will be demonetized within like an hour or two hours of your video going up. Me getting that email this morning, they manually checked. That's what taps my ass. I'm on some like list from XOS Digital Sports, and they manually check. That's what they do with me. It's not an automatic, automated algorithm check from YouTube. They manually check me. Like, they manually come for your boy. It's not like they rely on YouTube because YouTube doesn't have access to that all 22. So they really can't. They have to actually manually... They got to know who uses their stuff, and then they got to manually go for them. Like, are you for real? Y'all coming out here to take the ad revenue on a video that's coming up on, what, 7,000 views? Bad enough, YouTube already takes 30% of everything I do. Then you got these people coming out here trying to take the whole pie. Man. So that's my... If you ever hear me ever in passing say, man, FXOS Digital Sports, now you know who I'm talking about. I've, been, I've talked about them before briefly on this channel. Unbelievable, man. Hard out here for a pimp. Bro, they weren't lying. So... Whatever, you know, because when I messaged the guy, I said, listen, I'm promoting this because nil deals weren't involved yet. This is like when they first started hitting me it was in like 2020, 2021. And I told him, I said, listen, 
I, uh, nil deals weren't involved really as heavy as they are. Now. I said, I'm promoting these players. I'm putting these players out for people to see who don't have the time to watch college football, right? Or who don't like to watch college football. I'm putting them out here because I, I use all 22 in my prospect films. My, like when we draft our players, what do I do every year? I do prospect preview videos, right? Where I'll have a bunch of film and I will give you an, in, a super, like we're talking like four or 5,000 word evaluation on one player. I will give you, you know, I will give you an in-depth process preview. So I use the all 22 and stuff like that. It's just ridiculous, man. It's ridiculous. Shout out to John Green. Shout out, dude. Appreciate you. Shade Reunion hits me with a $10 donation. He says, appreciate your hard work, Reason. Thank you very much, Shade. Re Re Shade Rahoon. Thank you very much, sir. It's a badass name. I'm not going to lie. You know, kind of like my, my brother-in-law's name, Cash, right? It's badass. Shout out to you. Um... <laughs> Aaron Andrews reason to Kendrick as long as it's good kid mad city section 80 Kendrick all right I'm here for it baby I'm here for because that was man that was that was peak that was peak man I remember being at you know I remember at being what was uh Wiz Khalifa's Wiz Khalifa he used to it wasn't how high but he used to have that fest he used to do Wiz Khalifa when he came out when he was off he's coming off the um he was coming off uh, the success of Black and Yellow, and I went out with a couple of friends, and we saw Kendrick, and he was part of the set, and he only did like they only gave him like three or four joints. They only they gave him a short ass set, and I remember we were singing along every freaking lyric, because um, Section Eighty is one of my favorite albums of all time. So it's Good Kid, Mad City, and I I I remember people in the crowd looking at us, being like, "Yo, how did they know this? What the heck?" And then sure enough. Like a year later, everyone loved them. Sure enough, every yo, cartoons and cereal. Yeah, that's a real oh, bro. That's Gunplay's best track ever. Right, I'm gonna be honest with you. That's 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 man. I was I, see. I've been like Mac and see. I was been been on Mac and uh, um, well, I was on Mac before he passed away. And uh, Wiz, because, you know, I was a huge currency guy, too. Uh, whose car do we have to tip over? Um, I'm going to tell you, you know, let's go to the XOS Digital Sports Office and tip over every single one. Yo, bro, old K-Dot, I'm gonna not going to lie to you. After Good Kid Mad City, bro, I thought that man was going to take the crown. I was like, it is Kendrick. It is Kendrick time. Like, you know, listen, listen, here, here's the thing. I respect the craft when it comes to like, you know, to pimp a butterfly and stuff. I respect it. So here's the thing, because I've always said, you know, and I respect Mr. Morrell and the big steppers. I respect it. Here's my thing with where Kendrick's gone artistically. Here's my issue. And sorry for all you non hip hop fans. You got to listen to me for the second. When I was in the industry, what I would always tell, because I was an A&R and owned an independent label and stuff. And what I'd tell my artists, right? I worked with artists from Connecticut to Montreal to Ottawa to Toronto, all over the map. And what I used to tell them is this. You want to make an album that from track one to, well, I'm a firm believer in like, you don't go over 14, 15. And this 2021 stuff is nonsense, right? The most perfect album of all time in the hip hop genre is only 10 songs. And that's Illmatic. Anyways, I digress. You want something that flow. You don't want the same sound, but you want an immaculate flow from front to back in terms of listening experience for the listener, right? And but here's the thing, and I get it. When you listen to pimp, how to pimp a sorry to pimp a butterfly, you got to listen from track one to the end. That's how that thing's built. You got to listen one through to the end. The issue with it, with how he made the album, where he got it wrong for me, when you listen. To pimp a butterfly, there's no songs you can selectively pick out and ride out to. See, that's the problem. When you want to go down the street, you know, and you only got to be in the car for 10 or 15 minutes, your listening matters. What you listen to matters. You're not just going to, you know, you don't got time to sit there and listen to a 60 or 70 minute LP, you know? <clears throat> I mean, you know. Like, let's be right. Like, uh, you know, are you really going to ride around bumping all right? You know, King Kunta, you might have been able to, you know, 
<clears throat> but that was my problem with it. You know, fla like, look at what I, Elmatic, right? Flawless from track one to track 10, but I can ride around to New York State of Mind. I can ride around to represent. I can throw on, it's just, it, it ain't hard to tell. That's where the issue lies in with me. And Good Kid Mad City, he had that. Bro, Money Trees was one of the best hip-hop songs, uh, you know, since the 2000s began. And he kind of veered away from that. Like, I wasn't a huge fan of Untitled by any stretch of the imagination. So, if you're going to compare me to Kendrick, compare me to Good Kid Mad City, compare me to Section 80. You know what I'm saying? That's all I got to say. I say all that to say that. It's like I had, you know, listen, I was listening to J. Cole before he got big too. You know, I remember listening to J. Cole when, you know, he had DJs yelling over his his stuff. Right? Like, you know, I mean, you look at the come up was absolutely fantastic. Dollar, The Dollar and a Dream, all those songs, the Simba songs were absolutely fantastic. You know, Split You Up, you know, he, he was making good music for the ladies too. That was my dude, man. You know, the warm up was amazing too. Friday Night Lights was good. And then when he dropped his first album, the sideline story and started taking from Friday Night Lights, I was like, oh, I don't like that. So, but he's gotten better with time. J. Cole to me has gotten better with every release. While Kendrick set the standard with Good, good Kid Mad City in Section 80. And to me, he hasn't lived up to that hype. While to me, Cole has gotten better and better, but you ain't, this is hip hop, bro. You ain't supposed to be out here apologizing. Did Nas apologize for Ether? Did Tupac apologize for Hit Him Up? Did Cannabis apologize for second round KO? Did LL Cool J apologize for Rip the Jacker? Just saying. No, you don't apologize for this. You know, did KRS One apologize for. The bridge is over. You don't apologize in hip hop, man. Bro, just like there's no crying in baseball. There ain't no apologizing in hip hop. Shout out to Taryn, El Pad. Uh, you know, El Pad, he got that. That's my hip hop rant. Sorry. I, I, I can't. No, I got to say, we got a dolphin rant, though. Listen, Nick Wright. How can I take you seriously, Nick Wright, when I hear you talking about Tua Tonga Loa's contract? Right? Because Nick Wright's out here, oh, they shouldn't pay. And I saw Chris Bessard was out there. That's the theme today. And we'll talk about why. It's because of based off of what Tua said. The theme today has been, oh, you can't pay. You can't pay. You can't pay Tua, blah, 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 blah. First thing first. All right. I'm going to say this. No. Oh, <laughs> uh, don't do it. <laughs> Lights getting brother down minus 30 points. No, what's crazy is, bro, what's crazy is, who would have ever thought Cole would be sitting here wishing on Drake to come through and help him? Whoever thought Cole would be sitting on Drake to come through and redeem him? Remember, Drake ended Meek Mill. People don't talk about that enough. Drake ended Meek Mill. Now, Pusha handed Drake the L and handed Drake the L hard. Handed it to him hard. All right? So we got to be objective here because Pusha's that dude. You don't mess with Pusha. There's some dudes in rap you do not mess with and pushes on that list. But, you know, he's waiting. did you see what Drake wrote on the whiteboard, bro? Drake was writing about how there's always going to be competition in hip-hop. Everyone's always going to want to be the one, et cetera, et cetera. At least Drake knows the craft, bro. J. Cole out here apologizing and, like, you know, a couple words away from tears and, you know, out here wanting to make a We Are The World song. I don't know what's going on. Anyways, Nick Wright. I don't know how I can take this guy seriously when he talks about Tua. And I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you why. I don't know why. How, how can people take this guy seriously? In their in their mind, how can you look at this guy and take him seriously? Someone tell me this. All right. And shout out tonight. He says, Sunday night was emotional for me. My dad was a massive Dusty fan. He cried when the belt was stripped from Dusty. Finally, a Rhodes is WWE champion. Yeah, man. That was uh, a crazy night. That was a nut. That, that was fantastic, man. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that Dusty Rhodes thing was before my time, but you know, I always remember them doing Dusty dirty with the yellow polka dots. That's what I remember. They did him pretty dirty for how brilliant of a mind and how over he was. They did him really, really dirty. What are you asking AJ? Who's my favorite? What? 
Who's my favorite battle rapper? Got to go Hitman Hollow. Um, I don't listen to it like I used to. Like I used to listen to it back in the day when like disaster was popping. I don't listen to battle, you know, I don't listen to battle rap as much as I used to. Um, so, you know, you know, King of the Dot is obviously from Toronto, right? And I knew all those guys when we were coming up. I was coming up at the same time. They were just starting to get hot. So actually at one point I had signed a uh, female artist out of San Diego and I've showed people back her backstage and stuff. And I was going to make her into a female battle rapper and I was going to try and set it up. I mean, I'll be perfectly honest with y'all now. I mean, we were ghostwriting the hell out of her lyrics, but we were going to set it up. I, it was back in like 2011 and I wanted her, I wanted, you know, I had a team of writers and I wanted her to beat someone credible. Because, you know, like if, you know, a white chick who's easy on the eyes because she was that can spit bars, which she could. If I could get her to, you know, back then in 2011, that think of, I was trying to go viral back in 2011. Basically, that's what I was trying to do. <clears throat> so can't do it anymore because now, you know, how many girls have beaten dudes, right? You've seen it enough. So um, anyways, man, y'all. This hip hop conversation, um, Nick Wright. Um, I just can't see. And listen, I'm going to show you why. Look at this. Are we serious right now? He's talking about if Tua deserves a monster payday, all right. And yet he look at the star trajectory. The only one there is on the star trajectory is C.J. Stroud. Look at potential stars. Caleb ain't even been drafted. Uh, you know. Anthony Richardson hadn't even played a full season, can't stay healthy, and he's a potential star. Look at Purdy, a solid starter. Look at what Purdy's done the last two years, and he's a solid starter. It's just the hate, like the absolute hate. But look at the prince. The prince of what is Trevor Lawrence? Mediocrity? What are we talking about here? How am I supposed to take this man's football opinion serious? What has Herbert done? Tua's done more than Herbert in the NFL. What is What does Herbert have to show for his NFL career other than a goddamn Pepsi Rookie of the Year award? Can someone explain this one to me? What has he got to show for his career? Tell me. At least Tua can sit back and say, guess what? I never had a losing season. I've been to the playoffs two year back to back playoff appearances, and oh yeah, I just led the league in passing. What do you want? A guy in year four who leads the league in passing, or a guy who only gets accolades in year one? You tell me. And let's not forget, I tell everyone, I, you know, I hear, I saw this, this whole narrative this week. This whole narrative this week that Herbert, you know, never had a running back. Imagine what the hell was Austin Eckler? Just because they used him in passing situations more does not mean Austin Eckler was not good. The guy handled almost 50% of Herbert's career receptions. What are we talking about? Herbert was throwing to the line of scrimmage almost 50% of his time in the NFL. Why, Austin Eckler? At or behind the line of scrimmage, I should say. This does not act like he hasn't had a running back. Why do you think Austin Eckler, not this offseason, but the offseason before, thought he could go out and get paid because of the production he was having? Like, what are we talking about here? And I'll go even further with Herbert. I want y'all to do a test for yourself. Go look at Keenan Allen's numbers with Phillip Rivers right before Herbert got there. Let's not act like Mike Williams was a scrub. He had Hunter Henry too. They built him an offensive line. They've spent, they went out and got Corey Lindsay. They drafted Rashawn Slater. Corey Lindsay was more of a sure bet at center than Connor Williams was because we were making a, a positional change. What are we talking about? And now let's talk about Trevor Lawrence, the prince. Prince of what? The clown prince of football and mediocrity? Listen, you know what? This, this gets me so riled up, and I'll tell you why. Because I remember in 2020 when I told everyone, remember, I, I liked Burrow. I wanted Burrow, Tua, or Jordan Love. 
Those are the three guys I want. Anyone who's remembered me from, those are who I wanted. And I'll give you the order to a Burrow love. But I would defend love week in and week out on the Tuesday night panel because people didn't know ball. Right? Look at EM Dolphin fan and other people. I'm the one who put them on to Joe Burrow. Go back and remember. Go back. The receipts are all out there. And me and EM Dolphin fan basically started the Tua train on YouTube. Okay? And what would I always say? Because you know people in the chat, well, don't draft any of these guys. Just wait for Trevor Lawrence to come out. And what would me and, in fairness, EM Dolphin fan always tell people? Yo, this kid's overrated. He's not going to be what you think he what you think he was in that sophomore season at Clemson. And what happened? Every year at Clemson, he regressed. What's he the prince of? What, buddy? And let's not act like they they went out and got him Calvin Ridley. Look at the money they threw at Christian Kirk. They drafted him Travis Etienne. They ran a running back out of the room who was being very successful. Remember Robinson ran him out of the room. James Robinson ran him out of the room for Travis Etienne. They've spent money and built the offensive line for him. What are we talking about? I'm going to be honest with you right now. Other than the only thing that he beats him in is, is, is size and arm strength. And even still, with those, he's not in the same realm as Tua Tungvaloa right now. Like, I, I can't listen. These people will lie to themselves. I, you know, what are Herbert and what? Because they look the part? That's it. So, don't speak on my quarterback's contract if you're the type of person that thinks Trevor Lawrence is better than Tua Tungvaloa right now, or Justin Herbert has done anything remotely better than Tua since their rookie season. What are we talking about right now? This guy's gotten two coaches fired. Have we ever been picking in the top five with Tua Tungvaloa? Have we ever had a losing season with Tua Tungvaloa? Almost a 66% win percentage for the guy. Give me a break. The only one you can have the conversation with in that in that draft class that's that that's better than him is Joe Burrow. And now Joe Burrow's coming off another major injury. And we're gonna see what he is. Joe Burrow's proved to be more injury prone than Tua Tungvaloa. He's missed more games. But Joe Burrow has gotten to the Super Bowl, albeit again, you gotta be objective with it. That defense was fantastic and lights out for that run, right? I mean, you watch Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow couldn't even pick up blitzes, right? He couldn't even pick up hot reads. And he was getting that's why he's getting killed. It wasn't on the offensive line in that run. It was him not doing his job. So, listen, but that's the only guy you can make the argument for. If you Heading into last year, I had Joe Burrow as better than Tua. Now, this year, I got to think about it because we haven't seen him after the injury. If he returns to what he was before... You know, when he returns to that 22, 20, 2022 form, then, yeah, Joe Burrow is a top five quarterback in the NFL. But that's if. We got to see. So, miss me with Trevor Lawrence. Miss me with Trevor Lawrence, please. Well, that rant, that opening thought segment went, went a way longer than I wanted it to. Shout out to Hip Hop. <laughs> oh man uh, Taryn says member for 18 months year and a half shout out to you Taryn Nick Wright was sharing the backseat of a limo with Mahomes and Allen this dude would be skiing like Lindsey Vaughn or P Diddy oh he just hit him with the Diddy Scorpion King shout out to you hits me with screw XOS for taking money from your reason hey man it is what it is like I said just because they take the money from me don't mean I'm gonna stop y'all deserve the best draft content and I ain't gonna give you any less not to and it was easy plug there. Night one and night two, you know, we'll be live. Day three, we'll go for a recap. And so don't worry, we'll be live for y'all. Uh, appreciate all of you for supporting the channel. All right. Now, why did Nick Wright even say what he said? 
Huh? Why do you even have that little graphic made up? Well, the reason why he had that graphic made up was this. I'm going to play the clip and then we'll go into an article. Here is Tua Tungvaloa when asked about his current contract extension negotiations. You're heading into your fifth year of your contract. How have negotiations been with the Dolphins? I know it's a big ongoing topic. Yeah, I mean, they've been good. Right now, I'm letting my agent handle that. I'm focused on my family. I'm focused on continuing to better myself, better my craft. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about that when, when that time comes. But uh, for now, exciting times ahead, that's for sure. So if you looked at, if you go back and look at that Nick Wright graphic at the bottom, it says exciting times ahead. I don't know if two is necessarily talking about the contract. I think he's talking about in general with what this team's going to do this year. Shout out to Tua for the corn row. And I don't know if you guys have seen him, but he shed the weight. I mean, if you know the story, he was told to put on that weight to bulk up to protect himself. Now he's shed it a little bit. And you can see he's looking to be a little bit more explosive as an athlete. But he said negotiations are going good. That's where it's at right now. And just to go further in depth to everything, just so you guys know exactly what went down, here's um, what, what all the context of that quote, where it was from, etc. So on Saturday, St. Louis alums, alumnus and UA Beach native Tua Tungvaloa held the inaugural Tua Foundation Youth Football Camp at, are you serious? Is Am I going to, come on, don't, is that, Kamehameha? Kamehameha! Are you, are you serious? Do I get to say that? Is that Kamehameha? Uh, listen, we got Goku as our quarterback. Are you serious right now? That is amazing. That is the best. I want to play it. The, the, life goal for me is to step foot on that stadium. The wife was just talking about me about how she wants to go to Hawaii in the next couple of years. Life goal for me is to just step on the field and throw a football on Kamehameha Stadium. I'm just saying. All right. Although the Tua Foundation was established in 2021, Saturday served as the first time Tua Tungvaloa held a youth camp at Oahu. Um, Oahu. Ten years ago, Tua had yet to play a varsity football game at St. Louis. Since then, he ascended to State Player of the Year, Heisman Trophy finalist, National champion at Alabama, top five NFL draft pick, and Pro Bowl quarterback for the Miami Dolphins. Don't that sound good? Saturday was a full circle moment for Tungvaloa, who was swarmed with autograph requests following the camp. I wouldn't change anything that has happened to me throughout this process leading to, to me up to where I'm standing today. It was a journey, but everyone has their own stories, and one of those kids are going to be the next and better to a Tungvaloa or the next and better Manti Teo or the, well, I hope they're better than Marcus Mariota. And that's what we always strive for, for our kids back here in Hawaii. I hope they enjoyed their time looking forward to next year. Despite Tungvaloa's story career, each step in his football journey has presented its own set of obstacles. Tungvaloa began the 2014 season as a backup and St. Louis was routed in Tungvaloa's first state championship game against um, Kauku. I'm butchering that in 2015. Tungvaloa guided the Crusaders to the state crown as a senior in 2016, defeating those same Red Raiders defense that stifled him the year earlier. After beginning his freshman year at Alabama as Jalen Hurts' backup, Tungvaloa rose to true national prominence after leading the Crimson Tide to a second-half comeback over Georgia in the college football playoff championship game in 2018. Um, Tungvaloa's college career came to an unceremonious end in 2019, fracturing his hip against Mississippi State. Questions surrounding his health were prevailing sentiment during his pre-draft process in 2020. Following multiple concussions in 2022, Tua Tungvaloa's health was again a topic of discussion after turning to jiu-jitsu in the offseason for his training regimen. Tungvaloa didn't miss a game in 2023, leading to the NFL and passing yards in the process. When asked how he's prepared, this is interesting. When asked how he's prepared for the 2024 season, Tungvaloa declined to offer details. I'm not telling anyone what I'm doing this offseason. That's what makes me special in my way. I'm a very private person, so I think that's going to be in-house. Tungvaloa was also mum when asked about contract negotiations with the Dolphins. He's entering the final year of his rookie contract, a 50-year option worth $23.1 million that the Dolphins exercised last offseason. Tungvaloa is currently not on Miami's books beyond 2024. He's represented by Athletes First after separating from his agent, Lee Steinberg. 
They've been good right now. I'm letting my agent handle that. Tagovailoa set up contract negotiations. Focus on my family and focus on continuing to better myself, better my craft, and we'll talk more about that when the time comes. For now, exciting times ahead, that's for sure. Tagovailoa's return home included the Tua Town Tua Foundation Golf fundraiser on Thursday. So, you know, don't forget Jalen Ramsey and Taron Armstead also came out to it. And in reference to that, Tagovailoa said he didn't really have to convince them. He said, and I quote, I just asked him if they wanted to come, understanding and knowing that it's a long trip from Miami. Kind of had my expectations in the happy medium, not really thinking they were going to come. But that just shows the kind of teammates that they are. Very, very grateful that they came and supported the foundation. More importantly for these kids. So I thought it was really cool for both sides. Jalen and Teron both don't get to hear the local kids talk as much. Sure, they speak English, but the way these kids are, it's a little different, right? Hearing the questions they had for those guys and those guys answering, I know these kids really appreciate it, and they thought it was super cool, and I thought it was super cool. Man, shout out to – look at Jalen Ramsey. I told y'all, since the moment we got him, I told y'all, that is a leader. Jalen Ramsey is a leader. He stepped up against Fangio because he's a leader. This guy has no, played with Tua for one year and he's already traveling all the way to Hawaii and showing love to Tua's foundation and showing up and showing out for the kids. Man, much respect to him and Taron Armstead. Now, things to take away from this. Let's talk about this. First of all, him being private. You know what that's about. He's sick and tired of listening to all of y'all's nonsense. That's what that... I'm going to be... A buck fifty... Keep it straight with all y'all. That's what exactly it is. You know, I know for a fact, Nick, you know, I've talked to Nick Hicks about this before. Nick Hicks has told me straight up, you know, I post training videos of other guys I work with, whether it's running backs, DBs, receivers, whatever. He never hears anything. Not even 10% of the stuff that he hears regarding Tua when he posts stuff. So that even... People's reaction even closed off Nick Hicks from sharing that kind of stuff. See, all it takes, what, what's the, what did your mamas and papas tell you or your grandmamas and your granddaddies tell you growing up? All it takes is a few bad apples to spoil, the whole spoil it for the whole bunch. And that's a perfect example. Right there. Right there. You blame the guy? I remember the people in this community and in the media that were taking him shots at him over jujitsu, mocking him. Not only did it work, not only did he did he did it work and he played a full healthy season, he led the league in passing yards when he did play a full season. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Talk about an L, but these are the same people that come out and say, I'm right all the time when they ain't been right about anything. Especially the quarterback position. From Josh Rosen to Teddy Bridgewater to Skylar Thompson. These people haven't got nothing right. All right. That, that's the first thing I'll say. Now, with the contract negotiations. I'll, I'll be real. If they're going so good, why ain't the, why ain't the, why ain't the, why ain't the ink drying on the paper? I'm going to tell you my thoughts on it. This is just my thoughts. From what I understand, Athletes First wanted to see what Dak was going to do and that contract that was going to come through. They thought the Cowboys would cave. Cowboys have since announced they aren't caving. Now Athletes First is in a position, I feel like, where there's no contract coming down the pipeline for Dak because, remember, Dak was shooting for $60 million. So if he shoots for $60 million, they could come through and they could ask for $55 plus. That's what That's exactly what they were waiting on. And now that that ain't happening, they painted themselves into a corner. And here we are. What, what these guys need to realize is they're dealing with a very frugal organization. You know, everyone wants to give Chris Greer all this credit. Listen, I got a nugget for you. Here's a nugget. Now, let's see how many people remember this one. Because I've never said it before. I'll say it now. Would you be shocked if I told you Brandon Shore had more power than Chris Greer? And would you be shocked if I told you that they have a budget usually set over two or three years that they stick to and they don't really veer from? That's why they're a little frugal. And let me tell you this. There's a few people 
who have more, way more power than Chris Greer in that building. And I'll give you two of them, Tom Garfinkel and Brandon Shore. That's why. You guys have heard me. Why do you think you've heard me for the last couple months? What have I talked about? When people have talked about, oh, getting rid of Chris Greer, what have I told you guys in that? What have I said? I've told you the next guy's already in the building. It's going to be Brandon Shore. Why? The guy's already more powerful than Chris Greer. You know what? I'm going to tell you. Steven Ross runs this th runs the business side of this football team like he does his real estate businesses. That's why Brandon Shore has power because he handles the budget. The guy handles the money. That's that's it. He has Ross's ear. That's just how it is. So you know, rude awakening for those that want to blame, you know, Chris Greer for everything under the sun. And I'll, t you know what? I'll, I'll even go further and tell you all how I stumbled upon that. Because someone connected to the organization had heard me saying they had heard my multiple rants about Chris Greer not getting out ahead of contracts. And that's when I was talked to about the budget that they have set over a two or three year span. Usually that's how they work. And then that's when I was talk, told about the power and given details about the power structure. So I'm just actually being transparent with you guys, by the way, for all of you, cause you all know, I love Fanta, this pineapple grapefruit. I didn't even know they made pineapple grapefruit Fanta. It's from, it says made in great Britain. So it's from out there. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Because all y'all know I love my the famous Pineapple Fanta rant from a few years ago. For all of you that remember that. So, anyways. Moving on. Moving on for each and every one of you. Um, because we're going to get into a a uh, coaching staff move. And then we're going to get into some draft talk for all of you guys. Okay? All right? So, um. Let's let's get into this. All right. So Big Ten program losing key staffer to the Miami Dolphins. Rob Everett was a defensive coordinator at the division three level just a handful of seasons ago in 2018. Now he's heading for a spot on staff working with one of the brightest offensive coaches in the game as part of an NFL staff. Sources tell Football Scoop that Everett has left the offensive staff at Wisconsin and accepted an offensive assistant position with the Miami Dolphins. Everett spent the past two seasons as a trusted analyst for Phil Longo on the offensive side of the ball. The two logged a season together in North Carolina before Everett followed Longo to Madison last year to join Luke Fickle's staff. He held the title of Senior Offensive Analyst for the Badgers, where in addition for working the Wisconsin quarterbacks, he worked on opponent breakdowns, scouting reports, and leading-edge football technology. A longtime high school football coach, Everett has an extensive background on the defensive side of the ball, winning a state title as a defensive coordinator in Virginia while allowing just under 13 points per game at Westfield High School in 2015. So this guy, he's versed on both sides of the ball. You love to see it. But anyways, continuing on here for all you guys. Um, he, um, he also spent a few seasons as a defensive coordinator at Bridgewater College, which is a Division three school where he orchestrated the league's top defense in a number of categories. In 2019, he served as tight ends coach and assistant to the defensive coordinator of the Memphis Express of the Alliance of American Football before joining the Tar Heels staff. Everett spent some time with Higher Echelon, a training and consulting program where he worked on 3D simulation training, tackling analytics, and process efficiency. We're told that Wisconsin has already a new staff in place and aren't looking to fill opens, openings related to this move. So, you know, another, I mean, they've added a smart mind to this, this staff. No matter, no matter how you cut this, I mean, that is a, that is a smart mind who knows both sides of the football. You know, that is, uh, that's, that's impressive. And what's crazy is you think, 
you know, they'd come over based on his background and give him to Anthony Weaver. But no, his breakthrough to the NFL is coming on the offensive side of the football. So that's very interesting, man. Um, I'm uh, I'm very, very interested in that, you know. And, and hey, man, whatever helps the offensive side of the football get smarter, get brighter, I'm here for it. I'm here for it, all right? Now, let's get into some draft talk, all right? Let's get into some draft talk. We've got some interesting nuggets and tidbits. Let's start off with this. Barry Jackson, from what has been learned so far, Dolphins are using some of the 30 visits on later round picks, which is not unusual, as opposed to bringing in all the guys that could be in the mix of 21, like Byron Murphy, Jazir Newton, all those kind of, Jazir Newton, sorry, all those kind of guys. As always, they'll draft some guys who don't visit that they know enough about. Now, why does this matter? Why is this intriguing to someone like me? Remember what I've told you. I was told after he was drafted by someone in the building that Devin Achan was brought in secretly for a top 30 visit. And it seems like the ones they're leaking out, right? The ones they're leaking out aren't exactly moving the chain. That, I mean, that's literally... Where we're at with with that. I mean, and it seems like they're doing that to mask. I don't know, man. It seems like they're locked in on someone. It seems like they are locked in on someone. And it seems like they have a good idea. You know, that's what's interesting to me here. Like, it, it seems like. They have a good idea because if you look at the top 30 visits that have been confirmed so far, Quantez Stiggers from the CFL who what? You know, I think is going to go on day three. Eric All from Iowa. I don't, I mean, I don't think he might go in the third round, but I see him more as a four or five, round four or five guy. Christian Boyd. Now he's rising up boards. He could be a day two guy. Isaac Garendo. The running back from Louisville, he's rising up. But again, at best, day two. Kalen Bullock, you know, now for me and Kalen Bullock, you know, I think he's a day two, day three guy. Now, where I have him, you guys, obviously my my safety big board is coming soon. Um, but, you know, he's a top eight guy for me, right? Um, you know, so you look at, it's a pattern, right? I mean, and then who else? Rasheen Ali, who we talked about yesterday. And then a kid we're going to talk about in a little bit here next. So, you know, I'm just saying. They are being very mum. And it's, 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 I say all that to say this as well. Remember how open book this team was under Flores? How we knew everything? Like everything. So... They're being very mum about their first and especially second. You're hearing more from Barry Jackson, those guys, about our first round than you are about the second. Now, again, should we be surprised? No, because how many people saw Cam Smith coming last year? Now, it made sense when it happened. I was out here walking people off the ledge during the live stream because it made a ton of sense when it happened. But just an interesting, interesting thing there. Now, speaking of top 30 visits. Safety from the TCU. The TCU. Safety. Millard Nook Bradford came for a visit with the Jags, the Chargers, the Chiefs the Colts, the Vikings, and the Dolphins. Now, um, personally, you know, I'll be honest with you guys. Uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely a, a day three at best. Uh, you know, I don't, I'm going to tell you right now, he's not in my top 15. So, you know, Mm. Now you're allowed to invite 30 different prospects. I look at this more like, remember he's only five ten. He's like 191 pounds. Now 
what's impressive about him and what they're going to have him is you look at here. He ran, he got clocked at 22.99 miles per hour. All right. Now he ran a 40 of 4.442. Now, you see the number one name on that list is Dadrian Taylor Demerson, a guy who I've talked about on this channel that I'm is one of my man crushes. Super high on this kid. He ran a 4.41.40, and he got clocked at 23.09 miles per hour. To be honest with you, three of these, let me double check because I don't think I have Hampton in my top 15 when I break it down. Um, no, I do not. But I do have... Three of these five are like Dadrian Taylor, Demerson, Cole Bishop, and Jalen Simpson are in my top five safety. Uh, sorry, are in my top 15 safety. So, um, you know, again, speed, 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 right? Like his size, he's 5'10", 191 pounds. He's got to put on some weight here. Uh, he was at TCU for five years. Um, now... He's got four interceptions over 58 career games, like 231 tackles, 60 and a half of those for a loss. He's got 19 pass deflections and um, forced and two forced fumbles. Um, you know, I think this is a UDFA. Now, obviously he's a good athlete. He can cover, but when you look at his lack of size and length of length and lack of length and lack of play strength, eh, you know, I, I do not see this being, uh, you know, maybe they spend one of the sixth or sevenths on him. Maybe that's the idea because those are just glorified UDFAs anyways, really, right? But look at, they're not, like, they're using these UDFA picks on like day two and day three guys. We're not, we haven't even seen like a day one guy. So, Again, I go back to they are definitely masking where their interest lies. Now, I've heard J.C. Latham. I've heard Graham Barton. Now, I say that to say this. Drew Rosenhaus now represents J.C. Latham. Drew Rosenhaus has a good relationship with the Dolphins. We all know that, correct? Here's the thing. Look at what Drew Rosenhaus said. Now, for all of you who just watched my offensive tackle big board, remember, I had him at four. Check this out. We had nine guys at the combine. We should have a top 10 pick in J.C. Latham, the offensive lineman for Alabama. Forget about Dolphin fans. Dolphin fans who are dreaming about J.C. He's not making it all the way down to 21. Now, I've been, you know, one of the names I heard was J.C. Latham and Graham Barton, and now the word is he's top 10 pick. Top 10 pick. Think about that. Who's he going in front of? Fuaga? Fatanu? Sorry. Fat no, Fa well, he's going in front of Fatanu. But Fuaga? Fashnu? Alt? Who that? Which one of those is he going in, in, going in front of? Now, yeah, I like Jaden Hicks a lot too, Miami football fanatical. Wait for my safety big board. He's in my top five. I'm a big fan of Jaden Hicks. <clears throat> you know... Latham, you know what that tells me? You're going to have four tackles going in the top 12. You're going to have four tackles and potentially four quarterbacks in the top 12. I don't think Liatu Latu makes it to 21 either. I don't think Dallas Turner or Liatu Latu are on the board at 21. And then you look at the receivers. Look at this. Four offensive tackles, four receivers potentially, if you include Brian Thomas with Adunze, Neighbors, and Marvin Harrison, right? Four tackles, four receivers, four quarterbacks. We're at 12. We haven't even touched Brock Bowers. We haven't even touched corners, which is a premium position. Haven't even touched edge rusher premium position. I think at least Quinn and, Quinn and Mitchell and Terry and Arnold – you know, Kool-Aid has a chance, but at least those two will go in the top 20. So now we're at 14. Add in Latu Latu and Dallas Turner. Now you're at 16. Man, talent's going to fall to us. 
And, you know, I saw someone in the chat earlier say, hey, Reason, did you see what uh, CK said about defensive tackle? I actually read that thread. Here's the thing. What's my motto? What do I tell all you people? You never let good players stop you from selecting great players. If Byron Murphy or Jerzan Newton is on the board, are you really going to let a rotation of guys like Harrison and Tier Tart? And are you really going to let that rotate? And Deshaun Hand, you're going to let a rotation of those guys stop you from selecting basically the best one for one Wilkins replacement in this draft? I, I can't agree with that. That's where that's where I draw the line. You never let good players stop you from selecting great players. Bowers falling into the 20s. I don't know if it happens. I don't know if he gets past the Bengals. If Brian Thomas is gone... Do you th and the Bengals have lost Tyler Boyd and they might at least lose T. Higgins. I don't know if they let Bowers get past them. Unless one of those top four tackles is on the board. Uh, which I, sure as hell looks like it, that's not going to be the case. Jackie uh, is correct. The NFL is higher on Leggett than we think. That is 110% correct. I actually think, I think he's DK and Debo. That's what I think. That's what I look at when I see him. But he's crisper than DK was coming out. He's more refined and polished than what DK was coming out. Man, Leggett's a monster. I just don't want to see him in Buffalo. And I got a feeling that's who they're targeting. I think they're going to take A.D. Mitchell or Xavier Leggett in Buffalo. That's what I think is going to happen. I'm not gonna lie. That's what I. That's what I think might happen. You know, that's just where we're at. That's literally just where we're at. So, um, um, I, they update. I, I was gonna do it this morning. I, it's coming tonight for all you uh, patrons. I got a three takes video dropping for all you patrons. I'm just waiting on confirmation from something. That's what's going down right now. Um, and speaking of edge rushers, um. You know, Barry Jackson had an article discussing about defensive line options like Leatu, Latu, um, Jerzan Newton, Johnny Newton, Byron Murphy, uh, Darius Robinson. You know, he did talk about Chop a little bit and talked about how he's a little bit raw. He talked about Jared Verse. Jared Verse would be a really good pick too, right? Um, so, you know, he's, 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 He's even hinting towards, um, you know, edges are in real play for the Dolphins right now, which is, I've been saying for months. Edge and wide receiver, what if I was saying months and months ago? Edge and wide receiver were the sleeper picks at 21, and what's come out? They want a weapon, and Edge is starting to get pushed by the media a little bit. Now, another thing, interesting thing Barry Jackson had in that article, and I just want to show it for all of you guys because I've seen certain people mock it. In that same article, he says, a handful of cornerbacks are projected for Miami's range at 21, but with Jalen Ramsey and Kendall Fuller as starters and four young skilled players in reserve, Cam Smith, Kohu Needham, and Ethan Bonner, it would be difficult to bypass bigger, bigger needs and take a corner with the first-round pick. So that's Barry Jackson's way of telling all these people who have been talking about cornerback to Miami, cornerback's not happening. And I, I've been saying that. There's a little bit more confirmation for you. It does not seem cornerback is on the board and in sight for Miami. Now, when you get to those late day three picks in terms of the two sixth round picks, the seventh round pick, and UDFAs, sure. Will they bring in some cornerbacks? 110%. I think if you're looking for a defensive back, it's the reason why it's the next board dropping. Safety is the position to watch for the Miami Dolphins. And that's the position you're going to be watching next with me. All right? Just remember, tomorrow night I'll be back with ball game and Richmond. It'll be ball game's triumphant return. Thursday, I'll be live with Neil. Him coming off his WrestleMania weekend. And then I will have Ryan Roberts on the show this weekend. We're setting it up. Looks like it's going to be Saturday 
a day a midday matinee for all y'all so be on the lookout for that we'll be talking draft and then we'll continue to ramp it up because somewhere in between there i will be dropping my safety big board all right so a lot of stuff coming your way draft related for the miami dolphins to keep y'all informed appreciate all of you for coming through do me the favor there's over 375 of you on youtube watching smash the like button subscribe if you're new and i'm gonna get that 15k giveaway underway sooner rather than later um so be on the lookout for that all right guys peace out love y'all fins up and i will see each and every one of you on the next one